Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm just going to give everyone a few seconds because there's a little bit of a delay um, from when we start broadcasting. So just making sure that everyone has a chance to get here. Um, hopefully you all came directly from yoga or got to do Zumba earlier and have had a chance to, to have some fun and de-stressing. We're really excited that you've joined our conference and I'm really excited that you've joined um, the policy update workshop. This is the workshop I was most excited to see, which is why I volunteered to moderate. So very excited to be here. Looks like lots of folks are here. Um, I want to apologize for this morning's technological issues. Um, thank you all for your patience. We are indeed a resilient group. So thank you all for weathering that with us. And it think, seems like all of our tech issues are over and we are smooth sailing from here. So don't want to jinx us, but I'm feeling optimistic. So thank you for that. And hopefully you had a good rest of your morning and saw a great first workshop. Um, and have figured out the gamification system. Definitely let us know if you have any questions about any of it. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and get started because it's 1231. So I wanna say welcome and thank you to Lisa Eisenberg for presenting our state and federal policy update. Um, what's next for school health, school health and school-based health centers? Um, I will be um, chatting the evaluation in a bit and um, let me know if you have any questions. She'll be taking questions at different points and throughout the end, and we'll have some full questions. So we're looking forward to hearing from her. So take it away, Lisa. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Lisa Eisenberg. I'm the policy director with the California School-Based Health Alliance and really appreciate you all being here this afternoon to talk about uh, my, my jam, uh, state and federal policies. Um, so with that, um, again, I want to reiterate sort of what Amy was saying and thank you for being here this afternoon and at this conference. Um, I had the slide already included in my presentation and it just feels very appropriate for today. Um, I'm going to acknowledge that I'm presenting a lot of information in this workshop. I think you've probably already gathered lots of information. Um, had to manage some technical difficulties. And so I just appreciate and wanna acknowledge that I think this information might feel like a lot already on top of a lot. Um, and so I do wanna take a second to acknowledge that, hold space for building our resiliency to digest more information and um, help prepare our brains um, to take in even more info. And I acknowledge my presentation is packed with a lot of information. Before I jump into specifics, I just want to take a moment to set the stage for what I'll be covering in this over the next hour and 15 minutes. So I am going to cover some basic information about new policies impacting school health and student support services. So I'm going to take an in-depth look at the state budget, the California state budget that passed this summer. Then I will take um, a little bit of time to cover state legislation that also passed or didn't this year. And then I will quickly cover some exciting developments for school-based health centers at the federal level. So that's all just general information about what this is, what, what is happening at the state and federal level. And then I hope throughout um, the workshop and my descriptions, um, I really hope to connect how these policies can be turned into opportunities that you should all be looking out for as you support school health and school-based health centers locally. So um, before I jump into specifics, I'd love to get a little information about who is here in this workshop. So I know we all wear multiple hats, um, but please, uh, this is a forced single option, choose the best option that best defines how you're showing up today. Are you a school-based health center practitioner or manager, another school health provider like a school nurse, a school administrator or school board member, um, a local or state advocate or policymaker, a community-based health provider and partner, or a county department or Medi-Cal or private health plan representative? And if none of those fit right, feel free to chat your answer in, in the um, chat. And, I know Amy is going to open the poll 
And while we wait for folks to answer, um, I do want to quickly just cover California School-Based Health Alliance's 2021 policy priorities. So every year as a state alliance, we set our policy priorities for the year. And so what's on your slide are those that, that we've been working towards um, for the past year. And, and you should you will see hopefully towards the end that, that we feel like we've made a lot of headway in some of those. So um, a lot of them have been around advocating for resources and funding for school-based health centers, uh, addressing school-based health centers in the COVID uh, school reopening efforts, advocating for improved substance use prevention and early intervention, um, advocating for increased coordination at the state level across, across departments, and advocating for healthcare financing reforms that make school health services more accessible. So I'm gonna go back to Amy and see if she can let us know um, the results of our first poll. Absolutely, results are still coming in, but it looks like we have um, the most, the most represented category is other school health providers with 22%. Um, oh, and then and now it's up for, to a tie um, of 20% um, school-based health center practitioners and managers. Um, and then a little bit of local state advocate, about 10%, a little bit of community-based health provider. Um, and then some, um, a, quite a, substantial other. So let's see what people said in the chat. Um, board member of LA Trust, um, a combination of things, regional SMAA coordinator, FQHC administrator, mental health provider administrator, an RN, an LEA MOS supervisor, all kinds of great people are here. Lots of good chatting, community health and education worker, school nurse. Awesome. Yeah, a great mix of people. Well, great. It's wonderful to have you all here. That helps me sort of understand how to gear what I'm talking about, um, but really also great to see that there are so many of you that are doing this work on the ground. So um, that's really exciting. Um, so the first big chunk of information that I'm gonna be covering is about the state budget, the California state budget, which was passed in June. So some really high level takeaways that I hope you at least take away from this first big chunk of information. So the first one is there was no specific funding for school-based health centers included in the state budget. This continues to be something that CSHA advocates for. We've never seen the state invest directly in school-based health centers, even though we continue to, to work to change this. However, that leads me to the second main takeaway, that there are certain opportunities in the most recent budget that support and align well with the school-based health center model. So while there's not school-based health center specific funding, there are a lot of opportunities that we are looking at that do work well with, well, with school-based health and school-based health centers. Um, and this year's state budget, if you haven't already learned or heard has includes some unprecedented funding in school-based health and student support services and i think really serves as an incredible recognition of the important work that many of you have been doing for years um, supported or not in schools to deliver health services and then the last main takeaway which is a little bit of insider baseball, but I feel like will be helpful for you to understand as I, as I talk later on in the presentation. The main budget bill passed in June, uh, passed and was signed by the governor in June. But what happened a lot this year and what happens every year, but in particularly this year, many trailer bills passed after the main budget bill. And you might be asking, like, what's a trailer bill? Um, a trailer bill is often a way to add specific language to California state law regarding how budget items are going to be implemented. So um, the budget passes in June with big ticket line items for spending, and then the trailer bills trail behind, hence their name, um, and add details to how the, that spending is going to be implemented. And I don't know if this has actually been different this year, but I feel like what we saw this year was a lot of legislation get sort of 
slurped up into budget trailer bills. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that when we get to legislation. But um, it just has been a little bit fascinating from a policy wonk perspective to see how that has rolled out this year. So the, one of the first major investments in the state budget that I'm going to be talking about is the Child and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative. It sets an audacious vision, which I'm going to read, um, to transform California's behavioral health system into an innovative ecosystem in which all children and youth 25 years of age and younger, regardless of payer, are screened, supported, and served for emerging and ex existing behavioral health needs. So it sets a really audacious goal for transforming child and youth behavioral health and it pays for it with a substantial chunk of change, $4 billion. Um, there are lots of projects included in this initiative. I think that there might be upwards of 10. Um, and I'm only gonna cover the three in more detail on your screen. So the first one is a Medi-Cal Managed Care Incentive Program. And I'm gonna be doing a little, a, quite a bit of a deeper dive into this in, in later slides. But just basically, um, this program creates uh, a, a program where Medi-Cal managed care plans receive enhanced payments for, me for meeting certain goals, all under an overarching goal of increasing access to preventive early intervention and behavioral health services for K-12 children in schools. And this is set to uh, cost $400 million. The second program is a school linked behavioral health partnerships and capacity grant, which will provide um, $550 million total, 400 million of which will be specific to preschool through grade 12 interventions. Um, and it, it's a competitive grant program where eligible that looks very similar in terms of goals and activities as the Medi-Cal Managed Care Incentive Program, but the eligible entities to receive comp competitive grants are a little bit different. So this, this competitive grant program is open to, will be open to local education agencies, healthcare service plans, community-based organizations, and behavioral health providers. And we still don't know a lot of what is going to the, these competitive grants are going to look like, um, but will be a substantial investment that will be open and available to a lot of entities to apply for. And the last one that I'm going to cover, certainly not the least, is the Mental Health Student Services Act grant program. And this is uh, $205 million. This is actually an existing program that has been funded in previous years where county behavioral health departments are incentivized with funding to partner with county offices of education and school districts to expand school mental health services. Um, so a number of counties have already received grants in previous years and the $205 million is going to expand access to these grant opportunities for other counties in California. Oh, goodness, sorry. <laughs> um, so in addition to those three, I also just want to quickly mention that the initiative has a lot of other exciting investments. Um, it includes the creation of a virtual platform that will be available to everyone, every young person in California. Um, it has a lot of workforce initiatives, including the creation of an unlicensed behavioral health counselor or coach position. Um, and it does include uh, a grant, uh, grant process for, uh, for specific capital grants, um, facilities, and uh, space improvements for behavioral health infrastructure. So throughout all of the budget negotiations as they were being decided and, and now as they are being implemented, we at CSHA are really adamant and committed to lifting up and centering the role of school-based health centers in delivering behavioral health services to students. So um, on your slide, there's a link 
uh, to a memo that we wrote earlier this year that really makes the case for why school-based health centers should be central to addressing child and youth behavioral health in schools. I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, I'm not going to cover all of them, but I will call out a couple of, of what our, um, what we included in that memo is the first one is that students use school-based health centers for behavioral health services. We actually cite one study that found students with access to school-based health centers were 21 times more likely to visit school-based health centers for mental health treatment than anywhere else. And then um, I think one of the other real benefits to the school-based health center particular model is that by design, they provide integrated and physical and behavioral health care. So we know that not every student with behavioral health needs is going to self-identify as needing mental health or even come into anywhere saying, I need to see a behavioral health provider. Um, so oftentimes we know that school-based health centers provide that access avenue because a young person might come in for a sports physical or a wellness check. And during that screening, the nurse practitioner will identify behavioral health needs. And because of the team-based model, that nurse practitioner can refer the student to the licensed clinical social worker or MFT that's down the hall um, to see that student. So um, those are two of many reasons why we think school-based health centers can can and should be really central to this, this needed and incredible focus on behavioral health in schools. So um, I am going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into one of the projects of the Child and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative, and that's the incentive program for Medi-Cal managed care plans, um, just because I think it's it's really exciting, it's really interesting, and provides a, a really interesting avenue for us all to be engaging newly with Medi-Cal managed care plans. So some quick background on Medi-Cal managed care. Um, currently, there are 24 health plans that contract with the state of California to, de to deliver covered health care services to enrolled populations. And it looks really different throughout California. There can be anywhere between one to seven Medi-Cal health plans in each county. And you can kind of see a map on your slide of the different managed care models in California by county. So some of those plans are commercial health plans like Anthem or Kaiser. Um, and some of those health plans are run by the county. So Contra Costa Health Plan is an example. Alameda Alliance is an example of a county-run health plan. I think in particularly important for you all, this audience, is that 89% of children in California that are on Medi-Cal are enrolled in a managed care plan. So it is very likely if you are serving the pediatric Medi-Cal population almost all of those young people are going to be enrolled in a managed care plan. And in a nutshell, this is a terrible oversimplification, <laughs> but generally health plans, managed care plans, establish a network of providers to deliver care to enrollees from primary care to behavioral health to specialist, specialized care. Um, and so some of you that are in this workshop might be some of those contracted providers. If you are an FQHC, a federally qualified health center, you are probably a contracted provider with your local Medi-Cal managed care plan. Um, I think what is often cited in these conversations about, in particular about this program and why there is such a focus on Medi-Cal managed care plans in the budget is that there is often the recognition that generally, generally, uh, Medi-Cal managed care plans don't have an in-depth track, track record of coordinating and working closely with schools to deliver care to students. So while Medi-Cal managed care plans play a huge role in delivering health care to services to students, to young people, they may not be playing an, a really in-depth role in schools. And I would say where this might not be exactly the case is what is happening, what we know is happening is uh, the health plan 
is working for school-based health through their networked providers. So a health plan might contract with a federally qualified health center that runs a school-based health center, and that school-based health center is delivering covered care in a school setting. So that is some a, a very quick overview of, of Medi-Cal managed care. There are entire workshops on this, so uh, bear with the oversimplification with me. So back to the Medi-Cal managed care incentive program. Um, on the in the blue on the left side of the slide um, are the state established goals for the managed care incentive program. And those goals inc include improving coordination for student behavioral health, increasing the number of students receiving preventive and early intervention behavioral health services, and increasing access to health plan covered behavioral health services in schools. So on the right is a little bit more information about where we are in terms of timing and what the timeline for this program is going to look like. And we're, we're in the beginning of the implementation stage. So a lot of this is in flux. But um, there is a stakeholder group that's meeting right now. There are lots of school district representatives, lots of county behavioral health representatives, lots of health plan representatives. And we at CSHA are a very active member in that stakeholder group. Um, all accounts say that the start date for this program is going to be as early as January 2022, which I don't know about you, but feels like it's right around the corner. Um, and I do want to acknowledge we don't quite have a good sense of what they mean by start, like what is going to start in January. Um, what we are most likely going to see in the first year of 2022 is that health plans are going to be asked to begin planning alongside and in partnership with county behavioral health departments, local organizations, local education agencies, and all together um, will be asked to be assessing the need for school-based behavioral health. Um, and then, Right now, we are actually in the stakeholder group is providing a lot of feedback on what the target interventions will be that health plans can implement and essentially pay for, um, can implement in partnership with those entities and then also invest in. So some of those possible target interventions that have been discussed, at least at the state level, um, the state hasn't organized these interventions into these two categories, but I think it's a helpful way. It's at least a helpful way that I am thinking about them. Um, and the first category um, are, are those interventions that increase access to prevention and early intervention programs and services. So those of us that are familiar with the school mental health model would recognize a lot of these interventions as tier one school-wide services and some tier two targeted interventions. And so some of the examples that have been floated by the state are school-wide wellness programs like mental health first aid, suicide prevention strategies, and parent and family support. And there are many, many, many other in interventions. This is not the only ones that have been floated by the state. Um, and that leads me to the second category are those interventions that um, are interventions that would increase access to Medi-Cal managed care covered services. So services that the health plans are already responsible for, who deliver through their contracted providers. And so the interventions would be those that bring those services onto school settings. So some examples that have been provided by the state are increasing telehealth infrastructure in schools, and establishing contracts with school providers. And I think, you know, on your slide, you're seeing arrows that are sort of my thoughts on these two categories of target interventions. Um, the first one, we all know that these interventions are critical for school mental health. And I think the question that we are continuing to pose is how will these become sustainable after the incentive program ends after three years. 
And then the second category is, you know, this is where we're really pushing for school-based health center infrastructure and contracts with community-based providers to deliver their services through school-based health centers or on school settings. So those are examples of some of where the conversation exists currently around these target interventions. So what does this mean for you all? What are you supposed to do with this information? And I think one of the first things that I would encourage you all to consider is, do you know the Medi-Cal health plan or plans that serve your areas? So we're gonna do a little activity and then we're gonna see how this works because I can't quite see you all in feed loop, but, um, First, the first step is, is to look up the health plan or plans that serve your county. Amy is going to drop a link in the chat. Um, you can click on that link that will take you to the Department of Healthcare Services health plan directory. You can search by your county to see what health plans are in your county. So you can do that and then come back to Feed Loop and in the chat, type in the name of your county and the names of the health plan or plans that serve your county. And if you are in more than one county, just pick one for ease, um, but we'll do that. We'll give you about a minute to do that and, and, and come on back and then, and then Amy will start reading out some of the answers that are coming in through the chat. Thanks, Lisa. That link has been chatted. Um, and as we know, there is that 10 second delay, so it might take a second, although people are already chatting. We have um, IEHP and Molina and Riverside and um, Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, HPSM, Santa Clara Family Health Plan, in Monterey County, Central, oh, they're coming so fast I can't read them, <laughs> Central California Alliance for Health. Uh, region 1 is Partnership Healthcare Plan, in Marin Partnership Health Plan, in Sonoma County Partnership Health Plan, in San Bernardino we have IHP and Molina again. Yeah, people are on it. They are figuring this out. Alameda County is Alameda Alliance and MABX Partnership. Um, San Diego United Healthcare, we have Merced County, Central California Alliance, we have another IHP and Molina. Yep. There, we do have a strong showing from San Bernardino and they know their health plans. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's the yeah. first step. <laughs> um, Inyo County says California Health and Wellness and Anthem Blue Cross. LA says Health, LA Care and SCAN. That's how you pronounce that, S-C-A-N. Um, Sac County says Aetna, Anthem, Health Net, Kaiser and Molina. Wow, Sac County has a lot. Um, we have from San Jose Partnership Health Plan and California Health and Wellness, and from Fresno FCO Mobile Health Unit. Oh, that's where they're coming from. Yeah. Great. Are figuring out their health plans. Well, this is just one first step. Um, and I, I do want to know that as Amy was reading off those health plan names, there are representatives from those health plans involved in the Department of Healthcare Services stakeholder group. So, so health plans are big, <laughs> they're big organizations, but there are, and they are following this investment and they are aware of this. So after this first step, it's just a little bit of an activity to, to get you familiar with your Medi-Cal managed care plan. So what do you do next? And what do you do next or in 2022 really depends on your role and what organization you are with. So some initial ideas. If you are with a local education agency, and I would really emphasize that if you serve a high Medi-Cal population, this is really about services. Medi-Cal managed care plans are, are really about serving their Medi-Cal population. So if you are an LEA that serves a high Medi-Cal population, I would encourage you to reach out to your leadership, your district or county leadership or your county of office, office of education to make sure that they are aware of this program. Start planning, start thinking about what needs you have in your school community. If you are a contracted provider with a health plan and you serve schools, maybe you're a federally qualified health center or you're a school-based health center, you can begin by reaching out to your health plan contact for a meeting. Um, definitely engage your organization's leadership. Talk about the role that you currently play in schools, where you think there might be room to expand, what are some services, what are some interventions that you think would be helpful in 
covering these services in school campuses. If you're a health plan, you can reach out to us. We are happy to help connect you to providers or LEAs in your mark, in your area. And definitely, um, I think for everyone, there's an opportunity to meet with partners, um, whether they're school districts, whether they're county offices of education, whether they're community-based mental health providers, um, to sort of discuss your un the unmet need in your area and how a health plan could come in and help you meet that need. So those are some initial thoughts. Um, and I can pause now. Um, I'm gonna, this is the end of the deep dive into this um, investment. So I'm gonna pause and see if there are any, I can take two to three questions about this particular um, investment in and in, through Medi-Cal managed care plans. We do have one question, and sorry, I think it was a, a little bit earlier, but how much funding is in the school-linked behavioral health partnership and capacity grants? Good question. Uh, it is 500, ooh, let me just go back. Sorry, I'm gonna like probably make you di all dizzy. Uh, let me just, it's 550 million for the school-linked behavioral health partnership and capacity grants. And 400 million of that is specifically for preschool to grade 12. The, the 150 million is for community college investment. Thank you. And I believe that's the only question we have gotten so far. If people want to take a second to chat the other question or else you can keep chatting them and Lisa will come back to them at the end. Yeah. yeah, we've had lots of good chatting and answering your poll questions and answering your homework questions, but I think that's the only actual question. <laughs> okay, well, great. Please feel free to chat questions as they come, and we will try to gather them either at the end or the next time I, I pause for questions. So that was only half. What I covered has only been half of the budget investments. Well, not like not numerically half, but a chunk of the school-based investments have been on the health side. And so now I'm gonna cover the education funding for student health um, that has been included in the state budget. So the first one, um, again, there's lots of budget investments. I'm only gonna cover a handful of them um, that I think are particularly pertinent and exciting. Um, the first one is the school health demonstration project. And this is uh, $5 million to establish three technical assistance teams to provide two years of intensive support to 25 local education agencies to help them in leveraging Medi-Cal funding to expand comprehensive health and mental health services. And this will be through there's a couple options that are included in the budget bill, um, increasing participation in school Medi-Cal programs, partnering with Medi-Cal managed care plans and or county mental health plans, and contracting with community-based providers. The second uh, chunk of funding is, uh, funding was included for the California Department of Education to create the Office of School-Based Health um, this is $700,000 a year on an ongoing basis. And the purpose of this office, which will be established by January 2022, um, the purpose is to assist local education agencies in uh, uh, regarding current health-related services in CDE and to collaborate with the State Department of Healthcare Services and other, other departments and offices at the state level in um, the provision of school-based health services. So it's sort of a coordination at the state level um, to, to deliver uh, support to local education agencies on the uh, Department of Education side. Um, and I, I do, a lot of the language that was lifted and put it put in the budget trailer bill is language from a bill that um, CSHA co-sponsored with partners AB 563. So we're really excited to see um, this funding included in the budget. And then the last one I will talk about is uh, funding for community schools, which will be another deep dive that I am going to do for you all on the community schools model. But this is $2.8 billion 
to build out community schools across the, across the state. And very generally, community schools are a whole child approach to education. The budget trailer bill lays out four components of, uh, four required components of a community school. Um, the first one is integrated support services, which include the coordination of trauma-informed health, mental health, and social services. The second pillar is extended learning time and opportunities, which include before and after school care and summer programs. The third pillar is collaborative leadership and practices for, educator, for educators and administrators, including professional development to transform school culture and climate. So think of this as like the professional development to, to be doing your teaching and supporting student learning in new ways. And then the fourth, but certainly not the, the last, but certainly not the least pillar is family and community engagement, which may include home visits, homeschool collaboration, culturally responsive, responsive community partnerships to strengthen family well-being and stability. So um, uh, on the slides, which we will, we will share with you after conference, there is a link to a really great video that provides an overview of the uh, four pillars of the community school model. So, um, Again, a poll for you all is before today, so Amy, if you could start this poll whenever you get a chance, um, before today, how familiar were you with community schools? Very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not at all familiar? And we'll give folks um, a couple seconds, 30 seconds or so to, to fill out that poll. Sounds good, it's live, it's going. <laughs> So Lisa, it seems like there's a clear winner here of somewhat familiar, about 60% of folks saying somewhat familiar and the rest split between very and not at all. Great. I mean, I feel like I'm somewhat familiar with community schools, so I'm not at all surprised that that's where the bulk of um, the responses are. So that's great. Um, so going a little bit deeper into the funding opportunity in the community schools, um, and the timeline, I guess, is also really helpful. The State Board of Education is actually meeting this week where they will be voting, I think voting on or responding to the State Department of Education for laying out a timeline for these community schools grants. So we're like right at the beginning stages of the implementation. But basically there are three grant categories um, for LEAs and for the purpose of establishing new and expanding existing community schools. So there will be a category for planning grants for up to $200,000 for two years, up to, up to $200,000 for two years for local education agencies that have no community schools. And then the second grant category is an implementation grant for up to um, $500,000 per year for up to five years for new, expanded, or continuing community schools. And then there's a third category of coordination grants, which are up to $100,000 per year per community school. And that is, a bit, that is available for the um, 2024 through 2027 school years. So I know that that's a lot of numbers. Um, so there aren't going to be coordination grants available quite yet, but they, those will be available in, um, I guess that's in three years. Um, and all three of these grant categories do have a matching fund requirement. So coordination grants require a one-to-one -one match, I believe, and then the planning and implementation grant um, are a one to three match requirement. 
And one of the things that we are going to watch as the implementation conversation has is what can be applied as a matching grant. I know in the past it has been floated, can a, a, a contract or an in-kind delivery of healthcare services be considered a match for these community schools? So if you are a health healthcare provider and you're providing about $100,000 worth of care, um, healthcare services cannot be calculated into the match. Um, so that um, is something that we, are, we will be watching and, and watching how that conversation goes. And then there is funding is also included in the community schools investment to establish up to um, at a minimum five regional technical assistance centers. And these will most likely be with county offices of, of education. To, to, do, to be these technical assistance centers for our community schools grantees. Uh, I didn't realize as I was creating the slide how much numbers were involved in the slide. So I hope you track that with me. Um, so what are, what are the community schools opportunities for school-based health centers? How do school-based health centers in particular fit in? So I really think of school-based health centers and community schools as very symbiotic. Um, School-based health centers help with many um, of the pillars of the community schools model, but in particular, particular around providing integrated support and health services. I think school-based health centers are an excellent model for delivering healthcare services in, in school-based settings. Um, in our opinion, they're the gold standard model. Um, and there's really there's a really great blog post that Amy will put in the chat that explains how school-based health centers are part of one school district's community schools approach. So I think that that's a really helpful way of framing school-based health centers as a part of a community schools approach. The other part of that symbiotic re relationship is that the community schools model really transforms schools in ways that support and are compatible with school-based health centers. So community schools create coordination networks. They develop strong referral protocols. They create an environment where school staff and community providers work as a team. They provide environments where young people and families are engaged in the care that's happening in schools. So I think that there's a lot of ways that community schools create an, a really fruitful environment for a school-based health center to thrive in. So. School-based health centers contribute to the community schools model, and community schools help strengthen the school-based health center model. Um, so while there is no grant uh, RFP language um, to go on quite yet, um, we do think that there are some opportunities for school health and school-based health centers to help you start thinking about with your partners for what those opportunities can be. So can a community school grant help you bring in health partners to run school-based health centers? Could there be planning and or facility funding included in a community school's application to launch school-based health centers? Does hiring a community school co coordinator help improve linkages to existing school-based health center services or future school-based health center services? And are there ways that a school-based health center that might already engage parents and youth, um, maybe through school-based health center youth advisory boards, be a part of the way that a community school's application would propose to engage um, their families and guardians and youth in, in the community schools model? So those are some loose general ideas I'm going to throw out there again. We, we will be following the um, application development really closely and, and we'll be advocating on behalf of school-based health centers. And that is my last deep dive on the state budget. So I am going to pause here and see if any questions have come in. Um, and I, I think I have time for a couple questions if they have come in or, or are gonna have a chance to come in. Indeed, we have three already. Okay. Um, the first one is, I have a question regarding the Medi-Cal billing technical assistant teams. Will you address that? But maybe that's not a question exactly, but do you want to? Um, uh, I, 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 <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but I can take some guess. If you were talking about the school health demonstration project, 
um, that will be funding to provide technical assistance to, I think it is yet to be determined. We're still waiting to see how the, the State Department of Education plans on rolling out that funding. I anticipate that the State Department will uh, find, will have an application for technical assistance providers and, and hire technical assistance providers, consultants, organizations that can provide that billing um, billing technical assistance and for that demonstration project. So once those consultants are in, on board, then there will be an application for up to 25 local education agencies to apply. And I really have no idea what will be involved in that application or what will be a part of that application. But, but up to 25 LEAs can apply to participate in that demonstration project. They will work with that technical assistance provider to either troubleshoot the issue, issues that the LEA is having, having with enrolling as a school Medicaid provider or help that LEA um, contract with a federally qualified health center to come in and deliver health services on the school campus. So I think that there are multiple avenues that that can take um, and it's still to be determined. So I hope I answered that question. If not, maybe Nora can um, chat some more about her questions. Um, we have another one from Anya. Is there funding earmarked for non-Medi-Cal youth? Um, there is, there is not. There is, um, you know, the state the state's role is really in leveraging federal dollars to support uh, the Medicaid program. So that's a lot of where a lot of the funding is coming from is, is to invest in the, the Medicaid program. There, there is a lot of, there is funding that can be leveraged to support non, non, to support services to non Medi-Cal students. The community schools is, is not Medi-Cal focused. It's, it's agnostic. It's, it's a community school approach for all students. Um, I think the behavioral health infrastructure grants, which I didn't go into too much detail, is not Medi-Cal focused. And then I would say that there is funding and a policy in the budget that is um, meant to establish a fee schedule for school-based behavioral health services regardless of payer. So it will establish a fee schedule for um, all health plans private and not, and Medi-Cal to reimburse for school-based behavioral health services. And that, that has a longer timeline than some of the budget investments we are talking about. Um, and then I would also mention that the Mental Health Student Services Act funding is not particular to Medi-Cal either. It's counties play a role in delivering Medi-Cal services, but they also leverage Mental Health Services Act dollars that are not earmarked for Medi-Cal um, populations. Um, and so that is not focused on Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal can be a focus of, of a county's approach, um, but but there is wider access to services than that. And I, and I would, one last thought, is it, this has been a conversation that's come up a lot in the Medi-Cal Managed Care Incentive Program. And um, I would acknowledge that there's a tension. The Medi-Cal managed care plans and, and a lot of the stakeholders are saying, you know, the responsibility is to deliver care for Medi-Cal populations. And I think the state um, and organizations like ours are, are sort of saying, well, if you're delivering services in schools, you know, uh, the school population can be pretty diverse. And so that comes with the territory of delivering school-based services is that you might be delivering services to uh, Medi-Cal students and non-Medi-Cal students. So there's sort of an acknowledgement that there might be interventions that a health plan pays for that, that do serve non-Medi-Cal students. Mm -hmm. That makes I sense. I hope that helps. I think so. Um, one question from Jack is, what does a one to three match mean? Good question. Uh, that would mean that for the planning and implementation grants, let's say the school is required to put $10 up for every $30 that they're going to get um, from the state. So if, if the, for community schools, the LEA might be applying for some number of money for their planning or implementation grant. And what they have to show is they have a third 
they are providing um, a third of that money in match funding. So that might be from private donors, that might be from the low, that might be earmarked as part of the local control funding formula that a school might have access to. They're, they might be, they, and I think what, what will be discussed is can a school provide some of that funding at, in kind through a contract with a provider or does a provider come in and pay for a facility and, and that can be used as a match. So those are some so those are some of those dynamics that we're gonna watch play out. Thank you. And then Nora did clarify that she was talking about the um the fact that they will be funding two technical assistance teams to support up to 25 LEAs to leverage Medica funding. And she wanted to know if there's somewhere that she can find the language around the demonstration product projects. Um, we can always follow up about that. Yeah, I have my email. Um, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat and it's on the last slide. You're welcome to reach out to me and I can give you the fun budget language if you want to read it. That's, that's kind of all we have to go on at this point. And then one last question, um, and then we can take more at the end too, but um, if you are a nonprofit already in collaboration with a county health plan and the health plan is FQHC approved, do you have to apply to establish FQs at each of the schools? Or if you are already an FQ, can you integrate into schools without barriers? These are our friends at the Daily City Youth Health Center. Uh, that is a good question. Um, I, I think what you're trying to ask is, can you provide services at more sites um, as a federally qualified health center? That's my guess. Um, and yes and no. <laughs> I feel like I, let's I reach out to us. We can answer these questions. I think this is a little bit more of an in-depth response than I maybe even have capacity to answer at this point. I don't know if Amy, even if you have a thought on how to answer that. Yeah, maybe we'll put our heads together and um, get back to Jonathan from Daily City. Yeah. Good question. I love these. Uh, people are engaged. It's fabulous. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, people want to talk about, about policy. <laughs> okay. Um, so that was like a ton of information about the state budget. The state budget has so much. So I, I feel like that is an appropriate amount of space to give to the state budget. Um, so now I am going to talk um, much more briefly about uh, some, an update about state legislation and where we are. So uh, the California School-Based Health Alliance co-sponsored two pieces of legislation this, this year. The first was AB 563, which would create an Office of School-Based Health at the Department of Education. I think it was actually the third year we tried this bill. Um, and we are very excited um, to see that the language from the bill and funding for this office was included in the state budget. Um, so the bill officially becomes an inactive two year bill, which means we could continue to work on the bill next year if we needed to. But by all intents, by all intents and purposes, it became law because it was the content was adopted as uh, as uh, as part of the budget. So it passed. I think is, is what I will say, it passed. And we're really excited to work with the Department of Education in, in seeing that office implemented. The second bill is SB 316, which would allow same day billing for federally qualified health centers. And um, an example of this is uh, billing for uh, a patient to have a primary care visit and a behavioral health visit on the same day. And we, um, co-sponsored this bill because more than half of California's school-based health centers are run by federally qualified health centers in California. So what often works in school-based health centers to explain the purpose of this bill um, is that a student comes in to the school-based health center for a sports physical and the nurse practitioner identifies a behavioral health need during that sports physical and by design, what currently happens, that nurse practitioner, because everyone is co-located and works as a team, is able to provide a warm handoff to the behavioral health clinician that same day. And we know that the ability to do that in school-based health centers and in larger healthcare systems really improves follow-up for behavioral health. 
Um, so while it's a, a really common practice in school-based health centers, given the significant behavioral health needs among students and the way that school-based health centers are structured, there is a billing barrier for getting reimbursed for both of those visits. And so this bill was going, we tried to remove that barrier. Um, the bill flew through the Senate and then, and then flew through the assembly. Um, there was lots of support among the legislature, um, but we ended up not putting the bill up for a vote in the assembly. Um, the Department of Healthcare Services opposed the bill, and so we anticipated a veto from the gover governor. So instead of getting that veto, we decided to hold the bill in the assembly. It is now officially a two-year bill, and so we are hopeful of bringing it back next year. Um, and and working with the governor and the Department of Healthcare Services to address some of their concerns, um, because we think that this is a really important, it's really important for our school-based health centers and FQHC delivery of behavioral health large, um, largely. Um, other legislation that I want to quickly note uh, that, you know, came through this year, um, there was AB 32, which would extend some of the current telehealth flexibilities that we are able to do under the COVID public health emergency. So would either make those telehealth flexibilities like enrolling in Medi-Cal virtually permanent um, or make or extend them for a period of time following the public following the ending of the public health emergency. So an example of one of those that we're excited about is extending um, the ability for audio only visits for federally qualified health centers. Um, another bill is AB 285, which would establish a state school nurse consultant position within the Department of Education. AB 586 created, was a bill that created the school health demonstration project that I was talking about earlier. And AB 1117 um, would have restarted the Healthy Start program from the early 2000s. And um, we were really excited about that because Healthy Start actually seeded some of our current school-based health centers. And I will um, say that these first four were all, language from them was all incorporated into the budget trailer bills. So I mentioned the school health demonstration pro pro project, which was a, bu a budget item. Um, there was also funding for the state school nurse consultant included and funding for telehealth flexibilities. And lots of the language from the Healthy Start bill was incorporated into the community schools um, project. So the only other bill, um, the only other bill that I would mention is AB 1038 which would establish the California Health Equity Program, which would be a competitive grant program administered by the Department of Public Health um, to a number of different entities like community-based nonprofits um, to take actions related to health equity. Um, so that didn't pass this year, but is a two-year bill that can, uh, that can continue on the process in 2022. So those are a couple to mention quickly, and there's a link on the slide where you can uh, visit the page on our website where we have a list of all the bills that we are tr we tracked this last year and uh, put support positions in for. Um, and then last but certainly not least, um, I wanted to cover some federal updates, some exciting federal updates that we are watching and. I don't know about you, it has felt like there's been a lot going on in, in DC <laughs> the past couple of weeks. Um, so this is particularly about school-based health centers. Uh, there's lots going on, I'm not gonna cover all of it. I am not a federal policy expert. So this is really um, the, the federal policy changes that are particular to school-based health centers. Um, so as a, rem as a maybe a reminder <laughs> uh in december 2020 which feels like it was a long time ago congress passed and the president signed the second of three covid relief packages in the last weeks of 2020 so there were three packages this one was this one was the second one which i don't really remember 
many other details besides what's on the slide. Um, this COVID relief package included two small but very significant wins for school-based health centers federally. The first one is that in, it included $5 million for, uh, for school-based health centers through an existing federal 330 grant program for federally qualified health centers. And it was um, for those federally qualified health centers to establish and expand school-based health centers. I will really quickly say that five million dollars has been made was made available in the spring and has all been allocated at this point. So there is no longer funding in that, no longer funding available under that that amount. But did go out and I think one or two FQs in California did receive grants through that that five, small five million dollar investment. Um, I'd have to look. I think I think the feds got way more applications than, than they could actually fund through that tiny investment. So that was one part of the COVID relief package. The second part um, included a reauthorization of a federal school-based health center program. So this reauthorization creates a standalone federal grant program for school-based health centers. And it's something that at a federal level, we've all been pushing for for years. Um, there's no funding allocated for this program, um, but it does, I like to think of it, it does create the bucket. <laughs> Amy will laugh because I use this metaphor frequently. It creates the bucket for, for funding to be put into for school-based health centers in the future. Um, so no funding was allocated for that program, but that leads me to our federal appropriations project, a pro process which is happening right now. Um, the House passed a budget package earlier this summer that includes 50 million total for new to for new and to expand services at existing school-based health centers. And this 50 million is divided into two two chunks. 25 million through the 330 program for FQHC sponsored school-based health centers and 25 million through the the newly reauthorized school-based health center program and that is for school-based health centers that are not sponsored by federally qualified health centers so that's on the house side and then a couple weeks ago we just got just got word that the senate passed a budget package that included 60 million for school-based health centers in their budget proposal so no budget has been passed at the federal level. This is different than the Build Back Better plan. This is part of the state, the federal budget package. So that pa that I want to be clear that that package has not been passed, but I do think it's worth acknowledging and being really excited that this is the first time ever that funding has been included for school-based health centers in both sides of Congress. So, you know, it, it's a monumental win um, doesn't mean that there's actual funding yet, but we are really excited to see both sides of Congress really recognize the value and fund the uh, school-based health centers. Um, so there are lots of federal dam dynamics at play that are not even remotely related to school-based health centers regarding how Congress passes a budget. Um, I don't know if you all were tracking Senate, the Senate was was hoping to pass a budget in September, but instead passed a continuing resolution, which extended current sp spending categories to December. And those current spending categories do not include funding for school-based health centers. So we are currently in the process of waiting to see how that budget conversation goes in December. But again, we are optimistic and um, really excited that we've laid some some pretty exciting groundwork at the federal level to continue pushing for school-based health center funding next year even if we don't get it this year and that leaves me 10 minutes for questions so um we have time for questions i'm going to skip to my last slide which has my email address um which is Lisa Eisenberg at schoolhealthcenters.org. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and come back so I can 
key feed loop. Let's see. I'm happy to answer any questions. 